Okay, we'll get started. I'm Dr. Tom Van Vliet. I'm a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist, and I'll be speaking to you today about love in the brain and what we have learned from neuroscience, brain science. And uh, please uh, be aware that we are recording this session, and this will be provided later as a link to share and to watch again. And if you have questions along the way, please enter them in the chat box, and we'll be happy to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll just get started. And I'm happy to talk today about love, uh, given that it's Valentine's Day, this seems a very appropriate topic. Um, and okay, great. So what is love exactly? Um, this has been an uh, age-old question. Uh, we know from a science perspective that love is not a single emotion or state. Rather, it's a complex set of processes that influence things such as emotional bonding, attraction, and long-term attachments. And in the field of neuroscience, which I will be speaking to directly today, uh, we attempt to bridge that gap between the subjective feeling of love and what we can measure in terms of brain function, chemical messengers in the brain and the body, including hormones and neurotransmitters, various physiological processes and connections between the brain and their relationship to behaviors. And this will form the basis for which uh, I will give you some information today that may prove useful. Uh, you know, in, in neuroscience, things are usually discussed in terms of a construct or a concept. And one construct that's been defined in neuroscience is that love is a motivational state associated with a desire to enter or maintain a close relationship with a specific other person. Yes, sounds very sciencey. <laughs> so, um, one thing I want to make mention of before I proceed is that, you know, love has many forms, many different meanings, different people, uh, and it has different meanings within different contexts. And we, for the purposes of this discussion today, we'll be dividing it into the three uh, shown here. Desire, which is driven primarily by the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen. Attraction or romance, which is mediated by neurotransmitters in the brain and often associated with euphoria, increased attention to the object of affection. And then finally, attachment, which is associated with hormones, uh, oxytocin and vasopressin. And this is associated more with long-term bonding. So desire and attraction may be short-lived. Attachments are thought to live much longer. And one of the enduring traits of childhood is the attachment style that we glean during this formative period of our life. One other disclaimer I wanna make about love and the definition of love is that subjective experience versus biological mechanisms don't always map onto one another. While science can provide insights into the biological underpinnings of love and love subjective experience, it's definitely influenced by personal, cultural, and social factors. And as you can see in the figure here, here's just one way to break this out. There are many. Uh, you know, an individual has certain knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs that are unique to the individual. And then within the family system, peers, social networks, there's various associations that may alter the way we think about love. Within the community at large, uh, there are standards and norms uh, that are driven by culture, which may or may not map onto our personal or familial associations of love institutions, what love is appropriate in various contexts, school, work, etc. And then, uh, you know, policies or systems which try to regulate and support healthy behaviors. And these may even be further divergent from uh, the very core, what our individual beliefs are about love. And so we'll approach this conversation today with this caveat that we're speaking globally about love and and the ways in which we measure it in neuroscience are, are unique, and I'll describe them with as much specificity as possible, but also happy to take questions at the end. And um, okay. 
So we know that love resides in the brain. We often think of the heart as the center of love, but we know the heart is an organ that produces contractions to pump blood throughout the body. It may not have any emotional significance, but it very well may. There's some interesting sort of science around this, which is burgeoning in some respects, but also very preliminary. We know for sure that we can pick up signals in the brain that mediate and correlate with love, feelings of love, attraction, response to love evoking stimuli, pictures of a loved one, etc. And what lights up in the brain from our measurements to date are structures within what's called the limbic system. Okay, sorry, if I do freeze, I'll, I'll look for a note around that. I, I apologize. Again, happy to address any questions if any of my uh, monologue drops off. Sorry for that. Um, so limbic system, going back to, uh, you know, where love resides in the brain, uh, is involved in emotional processing and memory, and is responsible largely for attachments and emotional bonding. The other major brain system involved in love is the reward and motivation systems. And these include areas such as the VTA, caudate prefrontal cortex, the brain's reward circuitry is often thought about as being part of the system. And this is activated by love-related stimuli. For example, images of a loved one versus people who you don't know or you have neutral or negative feelings about. And looking at about how the brain changes in response to a loved one's image versus those who are neutral or otherwise. And then this reward and motivation system is responsible for mediating feelings of pleasure and motivation often experienced within the context of love. So these are the two major systems in the brain we'll be talking about today, and we'll take a deeper dive in each one of those uh, as we go along here. Love is transmitted chemically. So in the brain and the body, we think about the four following chemicals. These are involved in many love-related interactions. I started with dopamine. This is the feel-good neurotransmitter. You may have heard about this, often associated with pleasure and reward, and also associated with desire. Um, and this is known to increase the attraction, increase with attraction, and also romantic love. And this also drives motivational aspects of love. So this chemical is really critical for remaining that continuity of love across engagements and the necessary drive to stay attached to a loved one or seek out someone with which you'd like to be attached. Serotonin uh, is a neurotransmitter as well as dopamine is a neurotransmitter and serotonin is involved in mood regulation. Uh, interestingly, serotonin fluctuates with relationship status, whether you're in love or out of love. And strangely, lower levels of serotonin are associated with recurring thoughts of loved ones. I met someone new. I can't get them out of my mind. I got to call them. I got to connect. Your serotonin levels are plummeting in this regard. And this may be a, become an obsessive thought pattern, uh, which uh, can get you in trouble. But if, uh, if executed effectively, can drive you to connect with a desired other. Vasopressin is a hormone, and this is associated with behaviors that sustain long-term relationships, such as pair bonding and parenting. This is the hormone that's released when you're in conjunction in a loving relationship and going about various behaviors that solidify that bond, including raising children or even going on a date night. You can express more vasopressin in your, in your body and your brain. Oxytocin, this was uh, called the love hormone, we received quite a bit of press recently in the last decade or two around uh, bonding, its role in bonding and romantic attachment, and most notably feelings of trust. Uh, one of the preliminary studies or seminal studies, one of the first studies in this area was around a gambling tasks where people were asked to participate in an experiment where they were either given oxytocin or a placebo and then asked to navigate a, what's, you know, could be thought of as a poker game in which feelings of trust are often held tightly <laughs> to protect one's hand. Uh, in this experiment, although a bit controversial with follow-up and lack of replication, but it kind of opened the door around the notion that oxytocin can pr 
promote greater feelings of trust relative to placebo in that those who are given oxytocin during this gambling experiment exhibited more trusting behaviors. Oxytocin, interestingly, interestingly is also uh, released more during physical touch, hugging, and intercourse. So let's talk a bit about brain research investigations of love, and let's start with the benefits. And I'll just talk about these at a high level and give a few examples of other specific studies that are relevant as we go along here. But there's quite a bit of information here to digest. I thought I'd lay it out for you in, in numeric form. And these are very important and interesting too. So uh, love can alleviate pain through the activation of these reward pathways we discussed previously and even reduce the need for pain medication. This is sort of an important caveat or important notion around um, sort of the thought that, uh, you know, just have my loved one's uh, best interest at heart. Well, maybe it's good to go visit to support them. And this love does have a beneficial effect in terms of navigating pain and struggling and stress. And love can, by way of the reward system, reduce this overall felt sense of pain. Uh, brain activity changes when individuals look at pictures of loved one versus acquaintances. I mentioned this previously, and it's been shown to produce more activation of relevant neurotransmitters such as nor uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. Feelings of love or affiliation have been shown to enhance memory and attentional focus toward loved ones. Uh, they have a preferential part pathway in the brain for loved ones in that you have better memory and better attentional focus towards those you're motivated to attend to and to remember due to loving and affiliations around love. Interestingly, love and strong emotional bonds can reduce stress, anxiety, and even depression levels. So this has been shown uh, across a number of studies. And again, going back to point number one may be important for those who are suffering or going through various medical procedures or uh, stages of life changes, grief, loss, love, support, emotional bonding. Uh, it goes a long way to reduce stress, anxiety, depression, and even pain. Even more, uh, love can lower blood pressure, which reduces the risk of heart disease. It can also improve immune function. So these are really fascinating studies in that sort of the, the affiliation with other people uh, a loved one or a group of loved ones can actually change your physiology at a very fundamental level. And we'll speak more about this as it relates to the brain, but these are very, very critical functions as we know and appreciate heart disease is a major source of mortality and improving immune function can serve you in terms of your longevity. And it's also been thought to, by extension, increase the lifespan. Um, I don't know of any studies specifically that look at that, but <clears throat> I think these initial signals are promising. Okay, let's look at some of the uh, challenges associated with love gone awry, perhaps. Um, the brain's reward system can lead to unhealthy addictions to love, leading to unhealthy attachment styles and relationships. Oftentimes, the uh, perspective of a loving relationship is founded within the context of the early life experience the models of love shown to you uh, and your family, and your loved ones can lead to behaviors that are not going to serve you long-term within healthier contexts. And this addiction type love can sort of be uh, a hijacking of the brain's reward system in an unhealthy way. Similarly, the end of a loving relationship can be very catastrophic for, I'm sure many of those on the call here have on through that, myself included, <laughs> it's really awful. It, it's been related to withdrawal symptoms that are similar in nature to drug addiction and have a profound effects on mood and cognition in that uh, a lot of brain activity and activation and bandwidth, if you will, is captured by this loss of loving relationship. And finally, the uh, you know, love gone awry can also influence the activation of the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, producing feelings of jealousy, possessiveness. Again, sort of other ways to maintain or try to capture or control a loving relationship in ways that are not healthy. Um, these are the deleterious sides of love. 
and uh, within the same systems that produce healthy, loving behaviors. Okay, so how does this work in the brain? I'm going to give you kind of a, a high level view of you know, what we think about in terms of brain activation, how the brain actually works. These are predominant notions in research and you know they're also good theories to to look at in terms of how we understand the brain over time and what we've come to appreciate in probably within the last 30 years is that 30 to 50 years is that you know the brain is often thought of as unique areas that contribute a particular functional significance so for example you know someone who's had a stroke and then overnight they just can't talk or produce words or they have problems moving their arm. And we often attribute that to the fact that that part of the brain that moves the arm or produces speech is what's been affected or damaged in the stroke. And therefore, that part of the brain which is damaged or part of the stroke foci is the seat of movement or speech production. And these were kind of commonly held notions up until the last 30 to 50 years that these independent agents, these centralized areas in the brain are responsible for functions. And this was thought of to be the uh, structure function conceptualization of brain uh, and how the brain works. And what we know now is that the brain is comprised of many different functional areas that collaborate. And the degree to which they collaborate uh, defines their functional significance. So for example, in speech production, if you have a stroke, you knock out one area of the brain, you can no longer speak, or you have difficulty producing words, is also part of a much larger network that's involved in motor processing, uh, allowing the motor part of the brain, the lips and the mouth and the articulatory musculature to form the right shape to produce words. That's also part of the network. Also decoding and translating and producing of words prior to, to uh, the actual the emanation is also part of the network. And there's probably six or seven other areas that are instrumental for forming the whole speech production uh, pathway, as well as the speech comprehension pathway. And these are comprised of different brain areas working in collaboration. And these little line drawings here, what I'm trying to show you is that these little pathways show the degree of collaboration. So for example, if we chose this brain area here, parts of the frontal lobe, we know that it, it it collaborates with other parts of the frontal lobe, as well as other areas that are disparate or long ways away from the frontal lobe, including areas here, you can see with the red lines. But what this image is trying to show you or impress upon you is that the brain works as a network. It's functionally connected across many different areas. Even though you damage one, you have other parts of the system that may be able to compensate or provide some distinct role and can produce some uh, recovery over time. So this is a very complicated picture, but I want to set this up to you so you have a, a general understanding of how we think about brain function and how the brain works in contemporary times. So I want to show you how this shifts with love, being in love, being out of love. So reliable patterns of activity across brain regions are, is thought of as functional connectivity. Uh, it produces a desired function. And these are often captured as resting state networks. So you can go into an MRI machine, which you may have been in for various things, a knee replacement, or perhaps you had a stroke, you've been in an MRI machine. This is a way to passively look at the uh, activation of brain areas at rest. And interestingly, they still fire in a collaborative manner. So what we can see, uh, if we look at this, is that we get several networks that, again, function in various functional ways. So for example, the salience network, this here, these brain areas actually attend to what's relevant in your world while ignoring all the other things that are irrelevant. So this network is really critical for honing in on a particular goal focus. And then you have things like the central executive network. This is a part of the brain and network that controls uh, problem solving, orienting, planning, execution, shifting your goal path if things don't work out. This is sort of the uh, CEO of the brain. And this is, uh, again, another network defined by discrete functional areas working in collaboration. And there are several others that deploy attention across space, interrupt attention, reorient, 
uh, your focus, et cetera. But these are all kind of just a, a smattering of the different resting state networks that we're gonna look at next as it relates to love. So sorry for that long segue, but I think it's important to, to form a little bit of appreciation for how your brain works and how we think about that in modern neuroscience. So this is a study by Song et al. I found really compelling, and this is from 2015. And this is how functional connectivity changes and how this affects your behavior. So first off, I want to show you two different groups. One group on the left here is a group in which they have been involved in a loving relationship for a period of time, much longer than several weeks or months. It's probably several years. And the group on the right is a group that has been uh, going through a breakup or has gone through a breakup and over, uh, again, a similar time frame, months to years post breakup. So these are two different groups. And interestingly, what we're looking at here is that same circle of relatedness between brain areas. And this is much more, you know, sciencey looking, but you can see just the general shape of how these brain areas relate to one another and how distinctly different they are. And what this is showing is that the brain is functioning very, very differently. Its collaborative activation patterns are very different for those who've been in a loving relationship for some period of time versus those who are recovering from a, a catastrophic breakup. Their brains are actively collaborating differently at rest. So this is a unique uh, picture into the brain because oftentimes studies are very uh, controlled. I'm going to show you some images of your loved one or the person that broke your heart and you're going to see how your brain activation changes in those moments, which is interesting, but doesn't really have any uh, relevance to your ongoing daily functioning. How is that affected? So these resting state networks give us some insight into how the brain is actively collaborating over longer periods of time and how it may be influencing your behavior in these two different scenarios, prolonged loving relationship or prolonged duration since a breakup. And here are the behaviors that are, are more often seen in one group versus the other. And this is very interesting. Again, the behavior is a manifestation of this different functional activation as a result of being in love versus out of love. Those who are in love more frequently monitor their own emotional state as well as their lovers, and they adjust cognitive strategies to resolve conflicts to maintain their romantic relationship most of the time. <laughs> this is a practice, as many of you know, it's not a game of perfect perfection, it's not the goal, definitely a practice. But these folks uh, in this particular study were shown to have more of these behaviors more often. And this is extension directly from the collaborative nature, the functional activation of their brain that is distinctly different from those who are coming out of a bad uh, romantic breakup. And those folks um, exhibited uh, behaviors that were more isolating. They were less optimistic, more negative. There was more uh, doom and gloom, more depression, more anxiety, more sadness. And over time, what we see here is that these behaviors change in accordance with functional activation patterns. And maybe uh, sort of a logical leap here, but what we want to do is over time see this functional activation pattern perhaps more mirror this activation more closely. And this seems to evolve over time. And what we see as highly correlated is that those who have had a catastrophic breakup, who have lost love that's meaningful to them over the long haul generate more and more adaptive behaviors and strategies and perspectives, which can be thought of as a sign of recovery after a breakup, in that the functional connectivity in the brain areas that relieve anxiety are much more prevalent and active relative to those who are in a loving relationship. So I found this very fascinating. I think it has a lot of implications for how we think about, you know, our behaviors and how they relate to our functional connectivity in our brain. The way in which our brain is wired, you know, as I showed in the last slide, but didn't mention, the way our brain is wired is in accordance with our activation. Those brain areas that actively fire together, wire together. And this is a core uh, principle of neuroplasticity that's used in Brain HQ to drive faster processing, better memory, and greater what's called cognitive control. The same dynamic uh, is involved in loving relationships and also within sort of the unfortunate aspects of losing a relationship uh, that changes this dynamic. But the brain, I think, instinctively wants to recover and the, the functional connectivity reflects that over time is that the brain areas that are involved in relieving anxiety are much more active 
during a recovery period or after a romantic breakup. So there's a lot to digest there. I just think it's a really fascinating study and a way to think about your own brain. You know, is my brain wired a certain way after this particular experience in my life? And how is that affecting my behavior now? So this is a really fundamental uh, correlation here. So can you train your brain to be more loving? Um, it's a very interesting question. And um, as I said before, uh, resolving conflict and finding new strategies to resolve conflict with your loved one is a practice. <laughs> it does take some training and some experience and some feedback. <laughs> Not always the feedback you desire, but nonetheless valuable. Um, studies in neuroscience that have looked at ways to train the brain to be more loving have relied mostly upon uh, various practices that are thought of to be as uh, mindfulness or meditation, but they all have kind of core elements that are, uh, you know, also generalized to other forms of practice or training, some of which are encapsulated within Brain HQ. So I'm going to just call these out and you can see on the diagram here, there's various brain areas that are uh, being activated or called upon to contribute. Again, these brain areas are often collaborative in nature and a network based activation, although we're calling them out here distinctly in this image. And these involve being aware of your mind wandering. We can spend hours, days <laughs> scrolling through uh, internet websites or, uh, you know, various social media without being aware of the fact that our mind is, is just freely wandering. We're not really intentionally looking for information. We're not, there's no goal involved here. We're just scrolling 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 so some of these training uh interventions such as mindfulness seek to improve the awareness of actually mind wandering in the moment you're mind wandering oh hey I, I, my mind drifted or i've been on the screen for an hour and it just totally forgot you know the, i lost track of time so these training modalities that are shown to improve love which i'll talk about in a bit here uh, are all uh, centralized on these four core functions greater awareness of mind wandering and also similarly, awareness of distractions. If in fact you are in a goal-directed mode, but you get distracted and you lose your focus or you have an attentional lapse, these training modalities such as mindfulness, speeding up the brain, becoming more uh, on point, more attentive and greater cognitive control as, as with Brain HQ training can improve your awareness of distractions and your ability to get back and reorient your attention to the goal. And oftentimes in the studies I've looked at this in relationship to compassion and love, I've used mindfulness, very, very simple practices where you either count the breaths as they go by, one, two, three, or they openly monitor the breath or some other foci or focal point, and then noticing when they have drifted from the focus or have become distracted and then reorienting attention back to the focus. Oh, I need to, I forgot what number I was counting on. I'm going to start counting the breaths again at one. One, two, three. And this is the general practice is this locking onto a goal, noticing when you're distracted or you're mind wandering and coming back, reorienting. And then over time, getting better at the reorienting, maintaining a sustained goal directed focus. And this can be done in a number of different context the research i'm going to reference next is all about mindfulness choosing the focus whether it's the breath or a visual object or a counting of the breath or some other focal point uh, these all require with practice better sustained focus but also with the knowledge that you know even though you're good at sustaining focus there's inevitably going to be some attentional drift mind wandering or some distraction and reorienting will be necessary and there's a particular game in our exercise in Brain HQ, Freeze Frame is all about reorienting attention. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can check out Freeze Frame on Brain HQ. So let's talk about what they, these studies showed in terms of mindfulness, this training modality intervention for compassion. And what they showed is that, again, in the brain, we looked at changes in regional activity. And this is in areas such as the insula and anterior cingulate. Again, part of the various networks that would control functions in the brain. And these functions are related to emotional processing. And as a result, the behavior that was more evident in those people that trained in the mindfulness task is that they uh, more efficiently processed their emotions. They were less hung up on anxieties or sadness. They had a better understanding of other people's feelings. 
and they more frequently generated feelings of care and concern for themselves and for others. And they also reported an increased uh, uh, compassion and empathy. So interesting, just from training the mind to stay attentive to a simple goal, noticing when you wander, reorienting and sustaining that focus can be enough to activate these brain regions and networks that are involved in generating greater compassion and empathy. And these are sort of the activation patterns within the brain. And this is the signal change in those who did the intervention versus not. And you can see that the signal change is quite distinct within these brain areas. In other studies we've seen or others have reported decreased activity in the amygdala. Again, the amygdala is a part of the brain that processes fear and threat. It's also uh, densely wired with the prefrontal cortex, one of the central executive nodes, which is shown to be thicker. The cortex actually grows in the context of these interventions. Um, and these, uh, you know, these two areas have been thought to be uh, involved in rumination and negative self-talk. So when the amygdala gets activated under fear or threat or loss, a loved one, the prefrontal lobe, creates a narrative and there's a sort of playing over again and again and again of why they leave me sort of thing. But those who uh, did the training to improve their compassion, love, um, uh, by proxy doing not any of that actually, <laughs> doing just to focus attention training, uh, were actually able to be less reactive to negative stimuli and more positive, to adopt a more positive outlook overall, to better, better regulate their emotions, and to help them respond more compassionately to challenging situations. So this is an indication here of the amygdala activation shrinking relative to pre versus post. And again, growth in the prefrontal cortex as a result of these interventions. So I gave you a lot to think about there. There's a lot of science to unpack. I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, but I'm curious to know, how does love affect your, how's your behavior, sorry, How's your behaviors change when you are in or out of love? I'd be happy to field your questions now. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for that presentation. It was great. Um, just as a reminder, uh, everyone, that you can put a question in the Q&A and so that Tom can answer it. And I will be kind of just feeding him the questions so that he doesn't have to do two things at once. Uh, the first question we have for you, Tom, is, is there a physical difference in the brain between love for a child versus love for a lover? Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I think there are studies that dissociate those two contexts. And I think the difference there is related to attachment type love rather than desire or um, um, attraction right, in the romantic context. Attachment type, type love is seemingly different in that it's more supportive it's around bonding. These obviously can uh, overlap in, in healthy relationships. There can be um, both, certainly in the parent-child relationship or family relationship. I think the bonding is distinctly different in terms of its behavioral manifestation, clearly. But I think also in the brain, there's a distinct difference as well. Um, I have to look into those studies uh, directly to see if there's been some direct comparison, but oftentimes studies try to parse out their targets as being, you know, the child parent bonding relationship or the desire attraction relationship in couples. But great question. Okay. Um, the next question I think is pretty interesting. It's is love something you decide every day? Wow. Um, yeah, that's a great, great question. I think, you know, that speaks to sort of some of the data around motivation. So uh, in, a, in a truly loving relationship, which, you know, obviously can wax and wane. It's not every day you wake up feeling supercharged about your partner. Um, but definitely there's been changes in the brain that are associated with the duration within which you've been in a loving relationship. And this has been shown primarily in things such as the amygdala, or excuse me, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. So these parts of the brain are... Um, choosing that association between this loving feeling and this person, this object of my desire, and this memory by way of the hippocampus is greater 
is formed more greatly and densely so that it's accessible to areas in the central executive or prefrontal cortex to make it more readily recallable. Oh yeah, I do, I do love you. You were a jerk yesterday, but I, I, I'll forgive you because I do love you <laughs> kind of thing. Whereas I think new relationships suffer from that lack of bonding, that lack of concretization of memory and association that is helpful for longer term pair bonding. Uh, which may not be uh, evident in the early stages of a romantic relationship. So hopefully that addresses your question. <laughs> um, all right. So here's another question. Is there a basis of brain science to support the notion that those who've had loving relationships in the past are more likely to have loving relationships in the future compared to those who've never been in a loving relationship? Mm, wow, that's a really good question. That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I've I've seen that question come up in the research I reviewed for this. It's a really interesting one, though. Is there some sort of primer to having yeah. had a good relationship in the past? And I, I think you know, speaking as a psychologist now, shifting my hat from a neuroscientist to a psychologist, I think there is a lot of you know learning involved in in um, collaborative, loving relationships that are well balanced. I think you know, in the parental child context. You know, you you're not you don't choose your parents in the context you're born into is, is the context you're born into, and that forms the basis of your comparator. So as I go out into the world and navigate new relationships and loving relationships, my comparator is going back to what I knew growing up. And oftentimes there's some learning that's required to make things perhaps more attuned to your dynamic or preferences, or maybe even healthy if in fact your, your relationship with your parents wasn't as tight as, as you'd like it to be. There is some learning, I think, that's required to reassociate, you know, behaviors that are compassionate, giving, self-sacrificing, um, and then sharing love and being vulnerable. These things are often not obvious. And so, therefore, being in a relationship where you have that long-term capacity environment to learn and grow and become familiar with all the exchanges and the nuanced exchanges that happen in relationships I think it's really important and it's part of the learning process. So I, I would guess that'd be my hypothesis that, yeah, if you were in a prior loving relationship, you'd be more apt to be able to slip into that more easily with someone else who's also capable, who's gone through that same learning process as that same point of reference. Yeah, great. Um, I love this question. Uh, is it possible for the chemical reactions associated with romantic love to also occur in response to feelings of love for people in general or in like, like just the world mm. or a different thing. Yeah, no, that's a good one. That's a really good one. I think, you know, um, going back to that data around the mindfulness intervention, um, this was studied across many, you know, expert, so-called expert practitioners of this training and, and also naive people who just, you know, submitted their time for, you know, eight to 12 weeks to, train on something new, such as, you know, these interventions that are mindfulness oriented. And just to be aware, like this mindfulness is not really uh, a general phenomenon, you know, choosing a simple focus, noticing when you wander uh, and reorienting, being aware of distractions, reorienting, and then sustaining that focus longer and longer and longer can be applied to many different activities, uh, long bike rides, uh, yoga, um, anything that's a dedicated effort that requires attention that could drift is a form of mindfulness. And therefore, it's good to take that sort of realm out of the, you know, woo woo, um, you know, uh, spiritual space if in fact, it doesn't resonate with you and think about other activities in your life, you know, working on a project, doing art requires sustained focus and you're easy to get off point, doing music, learning a foreign language. These are all things that require attention, focus, continuity. And um, those elements are critically important in driving the brain. And I, as I saw in the research around this, in these studies, they showed changes in the insula and uh anterior cingulate cortex, parts of the brain that navigate emotional nuance in a way that's probably um, generalizable to behaviors that would serve others other than the intended focus. So for example, to address your question more directly, can you generate that same biological shift in your brain to have compassion for the world, for humanity in general? I think the answer is quite clearly yes from the studies to date. 
a lot of these practitioners practice sort of a, a non-directed loving focus, or they have a broad focus of compassion for many people or the entirety of humanity, if you will, that has a generalizability in terms of changes in brain function. So it's a great question. I think it's, you know, love and biological shifts in the brain and behavior associated with love is it's not constrained to the dyad couples or families. It can extend to people you don't even know, uh, which is really beautiful. Nice. So c- compassion is kind of a really important element of love then. Yeah, yeah, I would think so, definitely. And I think, you know, maybe there aren't the dopaminergic spikes that are involved in various forms of, you know, couple of love or uh, engagements around physical activities and touch and intercourse that may be distinctly different in the brain in terms of its expression. But I think, you know, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, self-reported ecstasy or uh, loss into a larger uh, compassionate feeling that comes along with some of these practices too, that I've heard just, you know, anecdotally. Yeah. Um, and how's that different? Like, can you feel love for, you know, kind of an idol like Taylor Swift or someone else, <laughs> the Beatles back in the day? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one too. Yeah. I think, you know, adulation and, and respect and, um, and looking up to an icon, maybe, Maybe different. I don't know. It's a very good question. I mean, I'm not sure people have looked at this, these differentiations in pair bonding type love or couple love or family love versus an iconic type love or it's like a, there's an element of reverence for some of these icons that uh, is distinctly different. I don't think anyone really worships their partner if you have a partner or worships their family. I mean, some do perhaps in some cultures it's, it's natural to do that. But I think in the terms of iconic and superstardom and uh, celebrity love, it's it's kind of a adulation or reverence uh, in some form that seems different. It's almost like they're they're distinctly above you, whereas mm-hmm. I think in loving relationships, you're kind of trying to meet each other right where you're at on the same plane, and that provides a nice balance. But these sort of you know Taylor Swift versus the common, I, I can't sing very well, so I have a lot of respect for her. I don't. My kids revere her, but I, I don't. <laughs> um, I think she's talented, but I think it's a very distinctly different type of affiliation or affiliative feelings, and perhaps brain chemistry is different too. I don't know. It's a great question. Well, this question is really appropriate since my cat has joined the Zoom. <laughs> love for pets different. A loving creature that has been around for a long time. Like, do can you get the same benefits from loving a pet? Oh, yeah, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. In fact, there's even new studies showing that, um, and this I don't, I'm not very familiar with these, but they're quite interesting in terms of, and these are peer-reviewed refereed journals that uh, show that you know, animals can express love too. And we, I think we know this uh, experientially, but I think capturing this in a lab or an MRI machine with an animal is really interesting way to, to look at a scientific lens uh, on this. And the early evidence is just, quite clear that they do have sort of the same capacity for expressing, showing, manifesting love biologically and certainly experientially with our, our pets. Um, they're like a member of the family. And it's also evidenced by, you know, the amount of grief that we feel on our passing, right? It's sort of, I think I like to think of grief as an index of the amount of love shared. So when you lose a pet, it's, it's really soul crushing because you've shared so much of yourself with them in, in a very different way than you do uh, with other humans. But I think it's nonetheless uh, equally as impactful. Yeah, and I recently saw a study that, um, <clears throat> you know, many people, especially when they're older, experience a lot of social isolation and that having a pet can have some of the same cognitive benefits and stress relief benefits that actually living with another person can, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely rings true. Now this question seems hard to answer, but hopefully you know, does dementia, affect feelings of love or only outward words and behaviors? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, I don't think there's been a distinct study of this. I think, you know, a lot of behaviors change with dementia. And, you know, again, going back to the, I spoke about at length earlier was about, you know, a brain is, uh, works in the form of various networks. So different brain areas have to collaborate and come together not only uh, at the same time but also in sync so the brain has to fire at the same time at the same rate across these different brain areas in continuity 
And if that firing pattern is off due to loss or decay of neurons in one part of the brain or another, then the pattern of activation is much weaker and more easily lost. And this is a core feature of dementia in that <clears throat> as the brain decays or retracts in the dementing process, these networks don't work as efficiently as they did previously. And therefore the behaviors that they manifest, compassion, love, connection, resonance, uh, also suffer as well. So that's, I think that's probably the best way to answer that question. But it's also important to know that you have the opportunity to improve upon that coherence of activation. So when brain areas collaborate to perform various functions, again, they have to collaborate uh, in time and in sync. So if one is firing off sync, you get this discoordination and efficiency of brain activation and subsequently and in parallel, uh, decay in the behavioral continuity or efficiency associated with that brain network. So in the case of love and bonding and tracking your emotional state versus your partner's, these are all gonna suffer unfortunately in dementia. But now is the time I think uh, it's important to recognize you have the ability to improve that in your brain and you can do it in a very abstract way. You can play exercises on Brain HQ that push you to be more and more in sync, to get the brain areas that fire together to more tightly wire together. And this is to experience, practice, and challenge. Brain HQ is a challenging set of exercises. Make those out of It's not an entertainment game where they're going to give you easy levels here and there to keep you hooked. It's going to challenge you every time. And we know this is really the important principle necessary for brain change and elaboration is consistent challenge. And once you get better, it's going to go a little bit more challenging. <laughs> and we're trying to keep you around 80% accurate, but you have to have those 20% errors for your brain to learn. It has to adapt. And the way it adapts is it fires in sync more consistently. And the behaviors that emanate from that pair bonding, compassion, the expression and reception of love, attention to those who matter, noticing when your mind wandering, noticing when you're distraction. These are all core elements of network functions in the brain, which can be bolstered through uh, abstract exercises like Brain HQ, which is great. Um, it's going to be also be accomplished through you know music training, um, foreign language, travel, any environment that forces you to challenge, uh, challenges you to adapt, and that adapt adaptation is consistent and growing over time. Certain people play music for a while, they get to a level they appreciate, and can play a few tunes, and they just don't go any further. Well, then the brain just stops growing and adapting. I think Brain HQ provides a really nice environment within which you can just pick up that challenge and keep going endlessly. We know a lot of data uh, shows that the more you train, the more the benefits of this network activation continuity and the behaviors associated with it grow as well. It seems to me like in the case of dementia, there might also, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that there's also a role in memory that, you know, kind of as your memory fades, the person kind of becomes less associated with you, right? You typically have so many memories, good and bad, of being with another person. And as those fade, like your connection to that person fades, like physically in the brain, they're kind of disconnected, right? Yeah, no, that's a good point, Margie. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The cortex, so the outer layer of the brain is usually what decays or begins to decay first. And also the hippocampus, this sort of central network that is involved in the formation of memories and also the recalling of memories later also uh, is uniquely affected in dementia. And you're right. So that continuity of memory, uh, you're the person I love and who, you know, in, in evolving into who are you is sort of a really uh, daunting uh, evolution of, of the dementia process. And, and yeah, I think it's definitely tied to that. And also sort of the relevance of the hippocampus and all these things we've been talking about thus far sort of forming those memories with those you love, uh, recalling those memories and targets of your affection are all definitely affected by dementia. Yeah. Um, how does the development of self-love kind of strengthening the ego show up in the brain? Does that look similar to love for other people or is that just totally different? Yeah, that's a great question too. I think, you know, the research I was showing that a lot of these people uh, in these studies were showing uh, not only sort of love for their partner or targets of their affection, but also greater self-love. And this also correlated and, and coincided with the reduction of sort of negative self-talk and rumination. And so therefore, as your anxiety and depression levels go down, you have more available resources to have compassionate for yourself to be able to rise to the occasion when challenges present themselves. 
in some way that parallels the amount of love you have available to give to others. And so a distinct network differentiation between outward love versus inward love, I, I don't know of that distinctly, and I'm not sure a lot of studies look at that, but in, a lot of studies look at sort of both of these factors uh, in, in parallel. And it goes back to the old notion, if, you're, you know, if your cup is empty, what do you have left to, to give out? And I think that yeah. holds a lot of truth to there uh, in, that, in that these studies, studies show not only improved self-compassion, patience, but also uh, improved uh, what's called theory of mind or being able to detect the emotional state of another person. So both of these improve uh, over time with various interventions and in the, in the loving relationship in the context of a loving relationship as well. So I think there's a parallel process there, and I'm not sure anyone has done a good job of distinctly looking at those or parsing those out if, it's, if, it's, if that's even possible. Uh, this is um, kind of an interesting question. Um, you mentioned that uh, withdrawal from love can be similar to withdrawal from you know, a drug addiction. So are addictions to substances kind of a form of love in the brain? How does Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, these are great questions, by the way. Thank you for, <laughs> <laughs> for these. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the uh, addiction, addictive processes um, affect the reward system of the brain, which is also intimately uh, involved in the mediation of loving and pair bonding and attraction desire. These are basically the same system, which is really interesting, right? So um, whether the focus of the love or attraction is a chemical or, you know, alcohol or what have you, or it's another person, you know, may be indistinguishable in terms of brain function and the subsequent behaviors that come from the loss of that, uh, uh, you know, loving focus, whether it's a, a drug or a person. Um, I think what may be different, though, is you may not get the additional hormonal boost, like from uh, vasopressin and oxytocin, which are seemingly unique to uh, addictions, if you will, or love for another person. Uh, maybe, you know, again, addictions are sort of a overmodulation of effort or energy or love given to someone else where perhaps a more balanced approach results in a more healthy relationship. So in the realm of addiction, you know, even if it's a loving addiction, so-called loving or obsession, um, you may not get that same oxytocin or vasopressin hit uh, at a hormonal level. So in that respect, it may be similar. It's a great question. I think it's a uh, I have to dig a little deeper to see if anyone's looked at that. That's a great question. Great. Uh, how is the death of a loved one the same and different from a major breakup? Is that does the brain kind of see those in the same way or not? Yeah, that's a really good one too. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, again, these are sort of uh, within science. Oftentimes, we have to have a lot of conditions controlled for and mapping those two populations into one study is probably challenging. Um, but I would think, you know, in terms of the uh, biological or physiological changes shown in each condition, uh, loss of a loved one or loss of relationship, I would imagine these are similar activation patterns and processes. Um, I think it's quite fascinating how well conserved the brain is to carry out component operations which fit different contexts. So for example, uh, and this is sort of a bit of a parallel example or tangential example, uh, we know training in Brain HQ is mostly uh, cognitive based. We're looking to become faster. <clears throat> We're looking to make better decisions. We're looking to memorize more uh, items or processes. We're looking to improve our perception. All sort of cognitively focused exercises. Interestingly, in parallel, and in many studies, we've seen a, a significant reduction in mood symptoms, depression, anxiety, uh, that occur in parallel. And it's interesting that the same areas that control cognition, um, generally speaking, the frontal lobe and uh, basal ganglia, are also involved in the regulation of emotions. So if you're improving by way of exercise, let's call it Brain HQ, uh, your cognitive abilities, it's likely you're probably going to be a better regulator, navigator of your emotional states and changes. And so this well-conserved machinery, the brain, can perform both functions with the same underlying mechanism, if you will, and across different contexts. So I think to address your question directly, this may be the same thing in grief 
and loss of love. The same biological processes in the brain are engaged and therefore the feelings are not so different. The behaviors that emerge are also not so different because it's the same shared uh, hardware. All right. And just um, so everyone knows, one of our um, future Brain HQ Academy webinars this year is going to be on the grieving brain. Um, so keep an eye out for that if that's a topic of interest for you. Uh, it's kind of a fun one. How do we decide when we're in love? And do we decide or do we know? <laughs> um, well, I can only speak for myself. And there's a mysterious element to love. And it's not captured by anything I've said thus far. <laughs> and it seems there's an irrational component that's hard to really pin down. And so um, I think there is, uh, you know, over the course of a loving relationship, there is some, you know, volition, there is some agency, there's some choice that you choose to persist, even though that perhaps the, you know, the glossy finish has, has worn off, you know, the romantic dating phase is over and now you're in the day to day and maybe you have kids or uh, maybe you're struggling with, you know, the effects of aging and, but you're still with your partner and you're choosing every day to make that work. And I think it comes back to sort of the question that was raised earlier around is self-love different from love for others? And I think the more you practice and stay aligned with self-care, sticking with your health regimen, brain health, body health, social relationships, good diet, exercise, all these things sort of make you more available to share love. And so maybe that's the decision you're making is that you're taking care of yourself at many levels, your brain health, your body health, your social health, your sleep. And then by extension, you have more bandwidth available to share love um, by way of either a decision or some resonance with someone that feels right. And the uh, experience is therefore much more gratifying. So it's kind of a long-winded way to address your question. Hopefully that, that gets at it a little bit, at least. All right. <clears throat> um, let's see. One more point I guess I should make about this. This is a helpful thing for me, and, and maybe this is obvious to others, but when I fell in love with my wife, it wasn't the relationship I was necessarily looking for. My goal-directed mind had a different set of parameters. <laughs> Yeah. But when I met her, I fell in love and it became clear to me it was the person I didn't want to live without. So I think it's important to recognize in love, sometimes it's not always what you think you're looking for, but you know it when you see it and you know you don't want to be without it. <laughs> so okay. uh, explain that. That's hard. This is a, a interesting question. When you talk about love in a relationship and in the brain, how does that relate to selfishness? For example, if your partner comes home and says they found someone else, if you really love them, you should be happy, not um, mad or upset or disappointed. Yeah. Uh, so what is that relationship? Yeah, wow. Well, um, <laughs> just I, just throwing you some softballs here, Tom. <laughs> well, put up my Dr. Phil hat again. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's a good one. I think... There's the, you know, I think possessiveness, jealousy um, are thought of as, you know, love gone awry. I think those studies that showed, you know, either reduction or increase in jealousy or possessiveness were associated with an addictive type love that perhaps was not balanced in some way. Um, uh, but it's a hard, hard thing to speak to definitively. Certainly every situation is unique. And so... Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, one way to unpack that for me, and just I could be way off base here, so forgive me if I'm missing the mark for you, the person raising the question, is that, um, you know, perhaps the jealousy or sense of loss may go back to some other fundamental uh, disconnect in the relationship at the outset. But I don't, I don't, I also know that I've heard anecdotally people that just change over time and grow and evolve. Certainly, you're not the same person you were, you know. 10, 20, 30 years ago, you've evolved and grown. And sometimes people grow in different ways. And perhaps that's the source of uh, the discontinuation of a relationship because of that uh, slowly emerging differences over time, which become apparent and obvious to one, but not the other in a relationship. And, and therefore, when one, when one departs, it's, it's really difficult uh, because that 
element with which you shared uh, was thought to be static and uh, unchangeable. And maybe, you know, love is a process and not necessarily a category. We're in love forever. Well, actually, it's a process where we work on our love together. And by working on our love, we necessarily have to work on ourselves first. So, I don't know. That's, I'm kind of all over the place here. Sorry. <laughs> that's a difficult question. We're at, out of time, but I thought we'd do one more question because I think it's an interesting one. Um, people who show more love and passion for work or for an activity than for people than for other people or actually are incapable of showing love. How are their brains wired differently? Or are they wired differently? Yeah, that's a good one. I think, uh, yeah, it may go, come back to sort of the issue around um, memory and association, right? So um, when I think of my busy day, I have priorities with work, I have priorities with my kids, and then my partner often comes, unfortunately, third in that uh, whole continuum or uh, of, of activities for the day and but yet at the at the very fundamental level that's the basis by which i'm able to do these things is by that safety security trust bonding with my partner that enables me to be freely capable to let go of all that and focus entirely on work or to be with the kids entirely or to be with my family or to you know go off on my own and do things that's sort of a, a, a natural springboard for me anyway from which i derive a lot of satisfaction with that knowledge but it does require work to to come back and to foster that so coming back to sort of love as a process rather than a particular uh, static state is probably a better way to think about it um, and it's easy to let that focus slip uh, when other things uh, grab your attention okay are there people who can't love yeah, I think I've I've definitely heard of certain neurological cases where their people are disconnected, and this is not totally uncommon following you know uh, concussion, and uh, just because the way the brain is oriented in the skull casing and impact injuries that are closed in nature can cause a diffuse damage to the brain, which often well not often but can cut off sort of the frontal lobe. We you know kind of forms who we know ourselves to be, and also the emotion processing centers, which are deeper in the basal ganglia, amygdala, hippocampus, uh, anterior cingulate, and insula. And there's some disconnect between sort of the self-knowledge and resonance of loving feelings. And I've, I've had a few patients over the years that have reported sort of a distinct flat affect. Like they know they should feel love or even like joy for certain contexts, but they just don't have that visceral feeling mm -hmm. and in the context of my research around this topic i was looking at some of the interesting findings around the activation of the amygdala that produces a visceral feeling in the gut by way of probably the vagal nerve um, in certain loving contexts so therefore you have a biological signature you have that sort of butterflies in the stomach sort of thing <laughs> associated when you see your object of desire or partner that is perhaps disconnected or damaged that pathway or processes affected by brain injury. Mm -hmm. So I think in those cases, certainly it's, it's very, very apparent that people are suffering because they can't feel love anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that not so happy note, <laughs> um, thank you everyone for joining. And thanks so much, Tom, for leading this discussion. It was really great. And there were a lot of questions that didn't get answered. Feel free to send them to us at support at brainhq.com. And one of our uh, great specialists will get back to you. Thank you. Uh, again, this has been recorded and we will let you know when it's been posted. Uh, I think that's it. Any last words, Tom? That's it for me. Thanks for your attention. And uh, please give BrainHQ a try. All right. Bye.